So uh, welcome everyone for MD2K webinar today. Uh, in today's webinar, we have two speakers uh, speaking about uh, visualization of high frequency mobile sensor data. Uh, they pro will provide a complementary perspective, whereas uh, I mean, uh, one talk will focus on exploration of the mobile sensor data for health research. And uh, the second talk will focus on expression of the same data but for the participants. So the first talk will be by Dr. Polo Chao. Uh, Dr. Chao, uh, he works, he's an assistant professor at Georgia Tech uh, who graduated from Carnegie Mellon uh, where his work won the uh, Computer Science Dissertation Award as an honorable mention. His group brings, uh, I mean, brings data mining and human-computer interaction together, and he innovates at their intersection to synthesize the scalable interactive tools that help people understand and interact with big data. His work has won several awards at, uh, at different conferences and has been covered widely by, uh, by popular press. Uh, today, he will describe the work done by his group on uh, developing this discovery dashboard. With that, let's turn it over to, uh, to Polo. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Santosh. Um, so yeah, I will be talking about the discovery dashboard, which is collaborative work involving a lot of people, uh, including uh, my student, uh, Dazu, Fred, uh, Peter, who graduated, hello, who was working with uh, Santosh, um, so also my student, and Mushumi, Mustafa, uh, and myself. And this is work as part of the MD2K Plus 2B, um, so about the uh, data science and uh, data analytics side. And so this is part of part of that bus. And uh, overarching goal of the discovery dashboard is to provide a visual analytics system for the uh, mobile sensor uh, data. And um, all these data, you can think of it as a large volume of time series data. So from a lot of participants, uh, from like measuring different kind of signals. And the dashboard aimed to provide a rich user interface. So for the user, the user here could be health researchers. It could be uh, all of us, actually. Uh, it could be students. Uh, it could be even the practitioners once we open uh, it up for people to explore those data. And uh, often because when we collect the data, we don't really know what we're going to get. There may be surprising, interesting patterns. So we hope this tool uh, can allow people to dig deep into the data, to see the raw data, and hopefully also derive some uh, higher level uh, pattern from it. So making sense of, of the data, like all the way from the raw signal to uh, higher level discovery. And to help with this uh, discovery part, we have uh, what we call a data mining motif discovery algorithm, which we will talk about uh, shortly. And uh, this is uh, based on one of the well-known um, algorithm called SACS. Uh, and uh, it would essentially turn these time series data into symbols. So a very easy way to think about it is um, that you quantize these um, signals like, into a lot fewer levels, and then um, so that you don't need to deal with all the continuous, uh, very subtle uh, changes, values, or looking at the data at a little bit higher level. So we, have, we aim to uh, provide all these functionality through the discovery dashboard. And so this is a quick screenshot. We're going to look at a demo uh, very quickly, um, which is going to give you an idea about how it will look like, or how it currently looks like, the um, discovery dashboard. So the main part of this discovery da dashboard is to show the data of the participants. Right? So each row here will be one participant. And we'll go through the details like, about what we're showing, what are the different colors, and so on. At high level, this is the, the main view uh, that the user will be with when they, when they uh, launch discovery dashboard. And uh, like any visualization tool, you can also expect to see a lot of uh, interactive function like doing filtering. Like if you say, I want to show participants um, who have a smoking laps, for example, you can do that. Or you want to say, align all the participants uh, based on when they lapse. So that's probably helpful to find out, oh, are there any patterns across all participants? So we can also do that, which is like a, a panel on the right. We'll also talk about it uh, shortly. This is that. Very quick overview about uh, how things look like. And um, a little bit of a design rationale um, behind why we design uh, this cover, this, uh, the discovery dashboard in the way that uh, we do. And the very first problem is that uh, a lot of the mobile uh, sensor data that collect or medical researchers collect 
that we do a lot of studies, right? So spend a lot of time, and uh, sometimes we know there's a lot of imperfection in the data and how the devices are used or are connected uh, to the body. Um, so often we may expect to see that there could be uh, interesting or surprising patterns. Um, and often these patterns could be hard to extract and interpret because uh, we may not even know what those patterns are. So this is where like, exploration tools like Discovery Dashboard might be helpful. So our solution, so this on the right hand side, is so we're aimed to have, provide these interactive exploration tools and, and also combined with uh, data mining and motive discovery to help uh, researchers, practitioners to uh, formulate uh, hypotheses. Right? So if they have a question, hopefully through these interactive tools they can ask those questions. And through the tool we can provide hopefully some answer, help them discover trends and patterns. And the second problem uh, we hope to address uh, is to handle the large amount of data that a lot of these data sets contain. And uh, also, at the same time, we want the tool to be uh, used very easily. So we don't want to people to have to install a lot of things or like uh, constrained to one platform. And so in our design, uh, so on the right-hand side, so we want to emphasize that uh, the user can have a lot of freedom in how they use the tool. So a lot of flexibility and exploration. And also importantly for usability and also cross-platform, we make it a web uh, browser or web-based tool. So that means it can run in any web browser. So you don't need to install anything. And also we are doing a lot of work. We're going to talk a little bit about it uh, in the back end to make uh, the response times fast so that when people do something, they can see uh, results immediately. So how to do all these uh, in real time. So so apparently this is uh, a, a kind of competing uh, needs, right? So there's a large amount of data in the back end, we need very scalable storage. And the front end, we need to give the impression that things uh, actually come back really quickly. All the analysis that we want to do would uh, come back very quickly. And the third problem we uh, hope to solve is uh, through the inter interface, we want to help researchers to easily uh, compare uh, participants or across co uh, cohorts that they define. And uh, to do that, uh, we visualize a lot of the data streams for each participant. And also uh, through filtering, we allow people to construct uh, cohorts. And so that is easy, easy to have for that comparison. So these are the very high level three uh, kind of problems and also uh, our solution that we propose to address them. And the data that we uh, have been using so far in uh, for development of dashboard is the uh, we often internally to MP2K was called the Minnesota data. So this is from a study uh, run by uh, University of Minnesota, uh, which is uh, why Mustafa also involved in the discovery uh, dashboard effort. And um, it's collected from a four-day mobile sensor clinical study, and has about 30, uh, 52 participants. And the study. Uh, the reason to run the, the, the goal to run the study is to uncover what causes uh, looking less. Um, and so 52 participants and about uh, 365 megabyte, uh, megabyte of data. And in total, we have almost 5 million data points. Uh, every data point is coming at uh, one second uh, per data point, so one hertz. And the data that we have, we'll be looking at using in, in this uh, data set, Minnesota data set, is there's infer stress. So based on uh, the signals that we collect, how do we infer whether a person is stressed or not? So uh, we are doing a little bit of color coding here. So this is also the color of the data stream that you're going to see in the discovery dashboard. So blue, we call the infer stress. So this is probabilistic. It may not always be accurate, but it's a good, good, uh, good guess. Right? And physical activity, so measured by the uh, sensors on the devices. Um, this heart rate, uh, so we can also look at look at that. And uh, smoking lab, so these would be, uh, we call it more like discrete events. So that means that what's the start time, what's the end time, um, what's the duration, so that's a smoking lab. So that means the first three uh, are continuous uh, time series. So these uh, numbers uh, vary. And for smoking labs, they will be discrete. So that was the, what's the start time, end time. And uh, Discovery Dashboard uses a combination of modern technology. So as I mentioned, it's a web-based tool, so it can run in any web browser. Um, so for the visualization side, we use uh, D3.js. So D3 is a very popular data visualization uh, library for the web. So we use it to quite a bit of the 
visualization uh, that you will see shortly. And then for uh, data rendering, we also use the React framework uh, that originally developed at Facebook. And for storage, so that's the back end. And so the current uh, storage, we are actually we're transitioning uh, into another more scalable database. But uh, for a majority of the time, we have been using SQLite. Uh, so very simple embedded additional databases to uh, database to store other data. So we're, we're, we're actually, as I mentioned, we're going to transition it to uh, another new database called Cronix. And also there is a little bit even more detail is um, having a state of storage uh, to provide real-time uh, visualization. Um, so we try to optimize the speed, the like round-trip time, we call it, like how fast uh, the visualization can pull data from the storage and to push it to the browser, the user's browser, so we have some intermediate uh, caching done by Redis. And also uh, for the uh, motive discovery, the detecting pattern, we use the algorithm called uh, SACS, so which is symbolic aggregation approximation. So we'll give a short uh, slide shortly uh, to give you some idea about what it does, like why is it helpful in analyzing time series data. So uh, SACS and so the technical way of thinking about it is that you want to create a symbolic representation for a time series. So, and what that means is that if you have like a time series signal, let's say uh, physical activity, right? That could imagine we go from like zero to one. So that means your your value is coming in every second, and it can fluctuate between zero and one. And it can be hard to extract pattern from these continuous value because you can imagine that 0 0.01 versus 0 0.02 is very little difference. So how do we measure, how, to, how do we tell if like these two values are close enough, for example, or similar enough? And now extend that idea to not only at one point, but maybe over duration, maybe over one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, and so on. So how do we do this in comparison? So this uh, SACS algorithm or this method is, is an to uh, quantize all these uh, continuous value into a lot fewer bins. For example, uh, using the same example, I, I, I talked about like between zero and one. So maybe we want to uh, chop up this range zero and one into only 10 um, uh, ranges or 10 bins. So, uh, so on the right hand side here, you actually see like some symbols. So this is why we call symbolic. So that means that A could be like uh, zero to 0 0.1, B could be 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 2.2 and so on. So you can adjust how many uh, uh, symbols or how many bins that you want. Um, but the overall idea is that after you convert your signal into the symbol, then instead of having a time series, now you have a, uh, a time evolving uh, symbols, if you would. Right? So for example, A, D, E, D, and so on. So that means like the first uh, range of values will be between 0 to 0 0.1, and then D would be uh, 0 0.5 to 0. .1. Uh, six and so on. So after this conversion, um, the first immediate benefit is that a lot of analysis, a lot of comparison uh, become a lot faster. For example, you want to uh, compare two time series, now you become uh, comparing two uh, strings of symbol. So a lot fewer things to compare, um, So it's, which also make it a lot faster. So actually, SACS is a very, very uh, popular, well-known uh, technique in time series analysis, and you can use the same formulation uh, after you do the conversion, you can do many other things too. You can do clustering, you can do classification, anomaly detection, and so on. So, so this is the, the main reason why we uh, use or have it built into uh, the discovery dashboard. And uh, now I'd like to show a quick demo of uh, how the discovery dashboard uh, look like and how they work. And this is a uh, demo, also a video demo that we put on YouTube. Um, so uh, I will show it here, and, but if you want to watch it later, uh, you are always welcome to go to YouTube. And an easy way to search for it is just Google uh, Discovery Dashboard YouTube, and then you'll bring see it as uh, one of the top. I think it's number one uh, top uh, top hit. Okay, so I'm gonna go out of the slide. The origin I was trying we're trying to show the uh, the live demo, uh, but unfortunately the uh, server that we are transitioning to, uh, so it's uh, not ready yet. Put on mute. Okay. So I'm going to play a little bit and I'll pause and then do a little uh, narration uh, while we go. 
So uh, you've seen these. So this is the main uh, motivation for the discovery dashboard. And that's how it looks like in the beginning. Oh, we can faster. Sorry, make it higher quality. Okay, yeah, it should look better now. So uh, in the discovery dashboard, each row is one participant. So here you uh, zoom in a little bit, you can see this is participant uh, 6000, 6001, so where my mouse cursor is, 6002, and so on. And uh, in this data set, each participant have roughly uh, three days of data. So, so a vertical line here separate the date. So that means uh, first day over here, and then second day, and third day. Each day is 24 hours. Block is 24 hours, yes. The each row is one participant, each block is 24 hours. And uh, currently we are using simple scrolling, so if people want to see a lot more, um, they can scroll down. Yep. And then here on the right hand side, um, so this is a both a legend and also a way to turn on and off what uh, people might want to see. So here we have in first dress in blue, uh, physical activity in gray, heart rate not visible yet in yellow, and smoking uh, laps in uh, red. So that means here where my mouse cursor is, so the blue uh, one here, you will see uh, sometimes like stress, you will say it's a little bit faded out. Uh, the reason is that when uh, activity is high, so that means people moving around a lot, um, that it's not very accurate. Uh, you cannot really accurate uh, infer um, the stress level, so because that's confounding factor uh, due to the physical activity, so which is why we fade it out. So here uh, we look at the toggle uh, on, so we just turn on heart rate. So here in this data, we only have four uh, data stream, but uh, what we're doing now is to extend this support so that it can be an uh, arbitrary number of uh, time series. So that means if you have a new data set, let's say you run a user study, um, you have a new data set coming in, you have a, like nine or 10, uh, you in this uh, legend, which is also the toggle, there you can uh, see all, all nine or 10 of them and then turn off whatever, or turn on and off whatever you want. And then on the right, um, so we can slide in a panel. Uh, this is where uh, you can do a lot of the filtering. Um, there are some more simple filtering, and then some that are specific to uh, analyzing uh, mobile, sens uh, mobile sensor data. So we'll look at those. Right. For example, uh, here we uh, just change alignment, participant alignment, to align all of them by what we call the laps of the time of the first lap. So remember that uh, each row is one participant, each block is 24 hours. So that means by default, uh, when we show all these participants, uh, it's just based on time. Um, but since we know that the first lap lapse in a, uh, analyzing smoking cessation, first lapse often is a pretty significant event. So when we want to look at, let's say, across all these 52 participants for those who laps, uh, when do they lapse? Uh, are there any patterns? Like, do they always, let's say, uh, lapse in the, in the morning, uh, afternoon, and so on? So this is a, a feature uh, where you can change the alignment. And here, that big arrow uh, down there, you see that we shift all the uh, participants. So now they are aligned by first lap, which is the, the red uh, vertical bar. And also, if you want to look at individual uh, participant, you can use our simple search box. You can select uh, which one, one you want to show. Delete all of them, then everything is shown. You can also do filtering to control um, which participant like fall under uh, your criteria, search criteria. Let's say we want to want to show participant who have uh, five or more laps. So you can use a simple uh, slider. Another slider we haven't shown here, also like, what's the date using the day of first left. 
And of course, like for any kind of uh, time series data, uh, what we're showing here is a very high level view. We can give me like an overview of the data. And sometimes you do want to dig deeper uh, to look at like the raw data. So uh, we provide a zooming feature uh, to do that. So here you see like when you enable the lens feature, you can mouse over a participant, a specific part of the uh, time series, right? And then see a zoom in view, uh, which we'll call the zoom lens. And also you can select a region. Let's say you don't want to just mouse over predefined uh, reset level. You want to specify, let's say a wider region. So you can drag and select a start point, starting point and the ending point. And you can shift that region around. And you can actually more, have more than one region, if you like, and multiple uh, focus, a uh, foci, sorry. Uh, like here, you can adjust multiple. And also, uh, next to the zoom in view, there is like a magnifying glass where the little hand is, and here is more visible, right, where my mouse cursor is, there's a, a magnifying glass. So if you click on that, so this is what, uh, when the uh, motif discovery uh, algorithm will be in focus. So that means the algorithm on the back end, so I just paused the video here, would start searching uh, among all the participants' data to see if there's any other um, time series fragment that would match what uh, you have selected. Right. For example, what well, we just click down was, uh, click was the region at the top, selected region at the top, and now all the matches found will be highlighted in yellow. Sorry, highlighted in yellow. And this one is quite interesting. So uh, particularly like this, uh, all these yellow matches. So this motif, like this like pattern, uh, it describes low activity. So activity is great. So that means the gray curve is pretty low, but rising stress. So the blue curve is going up, right? So you see here is a uh, dot. Uh, sorry, the zoom in view here, like pretty low activity, but stress is increasing. And we see this pattern in both participants 6012 and 6013. So this is a little surprising. Uh, we might uh, warrant uh, uh, digging into a little bit further, right? Because usually if we don't have really a lot of activity, that means we might be just maybe walking or maybe like sitting, we're not maybe not doing anything, but then somehow the stress level is uh, increasing. So maybe like reading a very stressful email or maybe like thinking something very hard. So that could cause the uh, stress to increase. So this is an interesting uh, pattern. So, so that's a very quick uh, walkthrough of uh, the, the Skyview dashboard. And as I mentioned, so we are moving the uh, this, uh, we actually had it running live um, a while back and then we are do transitioning to another server. But unfortunately before today, we're not able to bring that up online. But the plan is to uh, have it online again and then send the link to uh, the community uh, for everyone to try it out. And also we published a, a paper for, for this. So it was a, as a demo paper at UBICOM 2017. So a lot of interest uh, in it. Um, so I think, I think that's great. And a lot of people asked about it. Um, I mean, not even in the context of uh, looking at medical data, but just in general. So even just a tool like this that can analyze a large amount of time series data. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot uh, of uh, tools out there. So there are a lot of interest in it. And um, for those who are in uh, MG2K, uh, so you may also recognize this is actually the newer version of our discovery dashboard uh, that, uh, that we've been developing over year two and year three of the project. And the current status is that we are planning for public release of discovery dashboard. And uh, we've put, put it on, uh, oh, GitHub is actually on GitHub, but we haven't uh, flipped the switch yet. And we'll have locally have the server running, and the eventual goal is to have it uh, deployed and running on Memphis. So, uh, so that's why we've been talking to the team about this. And a lot of work that in the current few months is to uh, change the backend server. So you may remember that we have been using the SQLite server, uh, but that is not uh, uh, the end solution because as we have a lot more time series data, it's not going to be able to handle all those. So we're using um, a newer uh, database, a time series database specifically called Chronix, 
uh, that can support a lot of uh, analysis they want to do on time series data. Let's say kept doing uh, uh, average, uh, a rolling average over a time series. And um, you already have the Docker uh, version or the Dockerized version of the dashboard, so we need a little more testing before we move to the method server. Um, I think I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to skip to skip to uh, the last, the second to last slide. Um, so there's a benefit for using uh, Chronix, the, the new uh, database, and is that it already have a lot of built-in uh, features that we think researcher would like to do, right? So high-level analytics query, uh, for example, like finding uh, the, what's the computing estimates that doing standard deviation, computing percentile of the time series data. Um, how do you do uh, these search? Uh, so it already includes the SACS algorithm and also another related algorithm, which we think uh, researcher may also benefit from uh, based on fast uh, uh, DTW. And I'll just stop here. Um, so we hope to have it uh, up again uh, very shortly and then, then have everyone to try it and want a much more scalable, uh, faster database. Thank you. Thank you, Polo. That was fabulous and uh, right on time. So if, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> let's now welcome uh, Moshmi, uh, Dr. Moshmi Sharmin. Uh, she is going to present uh, a complementary work, uh, focusing is, is still being uh, on the topic of visualization. Uh, Dr. Sharmin uh, is an assistant professor of computer science at uh, Western Washington University. She graduated uh, from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her work focuses on human-computer interaction, effective computing, and technology design. And currently, she is investigating novel visualization techniques that support sense-making, pattern identification and decision-making of large-scale data for behavioral health problems, including autism, a spectrum disorder, and addiction and harassment prevention. So uh, continuing with the theme of uh, high-frequency, dense uh, mobile sensor data, uh, Polo presented uh, how uh, to visualize the data uh, to discover patterns uh, at the population scale uh, level or at the back end. Uh, and Moshmi is going to describe uh, I mean, her work on MyQuitPal, that is a participant-centric uh, I mean, uh, visualization to support the participant uh, in a smoking cessation program, and or to better so that they can just better understand their smoking behavior and uh, can move towards cessation. So, without further ado, let's turn it over to uh, Moshmi. Thank you, Shantosh, for the introduction. Uh, so can you see my screen? Yes, present? yes. And uh, we, we'll hold all the questions after the presentation uh, for, for both of the presentations. Uh, so today I uh, will talk about MyQuitPal. And uh, MyQuitPal is a visualization system, as Shantosh described. Uh, but the, and it is actually using the same data set that uh, Polo is using. Uh, however, the focus is quite different. So MyQuitPal's focus is the end users, the smokers who are smoking and who wants to quit. So we to give you just little bit background, I will not go into the details of why we decided to design MyQuitPal. So we all know that smoking is a really serious health issue. And there are lots of solutions, but we believe that looking at the really low success rate that existing solutions may not be optimal. And then we have all this smart technology. We can leverage this technology to come up with better solutions, hopefully. So MyQuitPal tries to utilize smart technology and provide solution to help people to stop smoking. So in our approach, we use the data collected from mobile devices and wearable sensors. <clears throat> this group of researchers objective identified factors that can contribute to labs, so stress, presence of smoking cues, among others. And for our team's goal was focused more on how can we design a system that uses all these really interesting data and create a system that can support long-term health behavior change. So that was our motivation. 
for designing MyQuidPal. So MyQuidPal is a system. It's mobile-based and web-based. So it has two components. Uh, MyQuidPal mobile app runs on a mobile device and it targeted to run on the smokers mobile device. It has a companion, which is a web-based system that supports reflection. What we wanted to do is create a set of visualization that will support comprehension, analysis, reflection, and hopefully decision-making. So the way we envisioned this system is it will not tell you that you should stop, uh, you should quit smoking, but it will give you all the right information, all the information that allow you to make a decision about what can you do to stop smoking or what are what are the things that may be making you vulnerable to smoking so our goal is to help understand help users to understand their smoking behavior and also support long term health behavior change so not just quitting smoking one day and then lapsing maybe in a week but once they quit it they would keep motivate they would be keep motivated to remain abstinent so that was the goal we are working for so the central idea of my quit pal is to come up with a system that will help people not only change their behavior but also maintain that behavior change so what we did we looked at many theories that talk about how we can motivate people to change their behavior for longer terms and we selected one particular the theory, self-determination theory, that talks about what are the features in an app that can help people to keep engaged and maintain this. So there are three components to this theory. The first is autonomy, the second is competence, and the third is relatedness. So what this theory suggests is if we want people to do something, they ha it have to be in their own interest. We cannot force someone to do things that they don't like to do. So if they want to change their behavior, that have to be their own need and it have to be motivated by their own interest. Then competence talks about users need to feel able to perform a task. So if we give them some task, they have to feel that I have the necessary skills to do it. And then the third component, relatedness, is we have to make sure that people can relate to other people that are similar to them. So they should not feel alone. They should not feel that they are the only ones going through this challenge. So these three were the focus points when we started designing MyQuidPal. And together, we believe that if we could incorporate these three features in our design in some way, then we will be able to help create a system that will help users to continue remain abstinent. So this is what my QuitPal mobile UI looks like at present. Uh, and I will talk about each of these uh, interfaces and uh, why we are presenting this information in this particular way. So our goal was to build a participant-centric system and help them in their reflection and comparison. And as I already mentioned, it, the goals were to support autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to help users understand their smoking behavior. Then we wanted to help them to understand factors that may lead to lapse such as stress, location, time of day, and we also wanted to help them compare their behavior with other people's behavior, if possible. So the first interface that you are seeing right now, it's a overview UI, and uh, you can see that unlike Discovery Dashboard, this is very simple. We went for simple design. We chose calendar as a view because this system is not for experts. This is for everyday people, people who have access to a mobile phone, who are smoking but who wants to quit. 
So the design decision is highly focused on using simple intuitive components. So we used a calendar interface and in this calendar you can see that um, we have encoded the days using uh, cigarette icons and the cigarette icons are all then the days are also colored, meaning some days are high, highly stressful days, we'll get a darker reddish color than days where we don't see a lot of stress. What we wanted to do is when you see this interface, provide some positive encouragement. So maybe you lapsed in here, you had a cigarette, but we said that you are doing great. And we, these interfaces are designed based on the same data set. So there are minute by minute data for every day, but we focused on displaying data by creating abstractions on that. So this is the first interface that users can look. And from this interface, they will get an overall sense of how am I doing? with my smoking. Some days maybe I'm not doing so great, other days I'm doing okay. We wanted users to also examine data if they needed to. So if you tap in any of the days from the previous screen, it takes you to this interface. It works. It shows you your smoking behavior along with time, also, it incorporates your stress data. So users can see their smoking behavior in relation to time. So whether there is any particular day in a time that, is, that makes them more vulnerable, whether there are specific location that makes them they're vulnerable. So things like that, highlighting what makes them vulnerable was the goal for this interface. So this particular interface, highlight smoking patterns, smoking times, relation between smoking and stress. This, the aim for this one was to help them understand this. The previous one was an abstraction. It summarizes a lot of data. So you just see maybe in December 10, I had five cigarettes, but it does not tell you when you had those cigarettes at that time, whether you were feeling stressed or not. The analytics UI helps you to get those information. So you start from the calendar interface, then you move on to the analytics interface. Finally, the comp UI, what it tells you is you are not alone. So if we have data from a group of cohorts, then it will show you where you stand. So if you say in the inter see in the interface, there are days, first day after lab, second day after labs, or post quit, third day after post quit, and all these circles are showing individual lapse events. So when people lapsed and what was their stress level at that time? By looking at this interface, an individual user should understand where they are compared to everyone else who were trying to quit. So this was designed to give them a sense that if they failed, then they are not alone. There are other people who fail, but they are also trying to improve. They are still trying to quit smoking. This should also give them some indication of people who have not failed. So what did they do? So we used information like time of day, stress level, number of lapses, and we plotted these based on the event. It's not purely temporal. So we are saying day one, day two, day three, but it's not December one, December two, December three. This data is created using what happens after you quit smoking, what happens at the first day, what happens at the second day, what happens at the third day. So how many people lapse at the first day? How many people lapse at the second day? So you, if you have not lapsed yet, that means you are doing great than all these other people who already lapsed. Or if you lapsed, you can see that there, it's not the end of the world. You can still go back and try to quit smoking. 
So the entire purpose of creating this interface is to provide this sense of relatedness and not thinking about I am alone in this battle against uh, this addiction. We created an additional interface and for this particular interface, we didn't have location data from the Minnesota study. So what we did, we collected some data from Western campus because we wanted to see if location had any impact. So we wanted to examine the spatial influence of smoking. So if you see in the map, there are locations that has uh, uh, these circles, dark red color circles. So we want perhaps locations. We wanted people to avoid these locations. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to show them where they smoked earlier. So maybe if now they are trying to quit, they should avoid those places. Then we also highlighted places where people in general smoke a lot. So smoking hotspot. We wanted people who are trying to quit to avoid these locations because we know that smoking cues those are very powerful like triggers so we wanted them to avoid these places we also want to show them like this is what happened in terms of location so maybe if you are near this area you lapsed at the past so why not avoid that area so about this interface we don't know for sure whether this will help or this will uh, provide users more information about this is where people smoke. So maybe if you really need, a, need to smoke and you are looking for a cigarette, you go and smoke. But we are hoping that people will use it to avoid these areas. So after we designed MyQuitPal, we talked, uh, we did not evaluate MyQuitPal in a formal field study. We are right, currently designing that study, but we did an informal evaluation. And what we learned from this is users liked this interface. So they thought it will be helpful. It will help them to understand their behavior and maybe it will help them to become more motivated to quit smoking. But we also learned that some of the tasks that we enabled users to do are just challenging. So if you think about the analytics interface, you can scroll and you can um, scroll horizontally, vertically, and look at many different days data. However, it's just challenging. Mobile screen size is not designed to support those kind of activities. So we found that comparison is really, really difficult. And it doesn't matter what type of intuitive interaction we supported. It be it still remains challenging. So what we thought is why not create a system that will act as a companion of MyQuitPal, but also will not have all the challenges that we are uh, trying to address in a mobile platform. So we created MyQuitPal Web, and it's a web-based analytics tool. Again, this is for the end users. And the goal for this part is support reflection and comparison. So we wanted to support deep analysis. In the mobile version of MyQuitPal, you can look at your data, you can look how you are doing. But if you want to analyze every minute's data, if you want to do temporal analysis, it would be really hard. So we wanted to support those type of analysis. We wanted to support comparison of self we wanted to support comparison with cohorts. And these things were really difficult to do with uh, MyQuitPal Web mobile. So in MyQuitPal Web, we created a smoking history analyzer. And if you look at this uh, data, it's the event aligned visualization. It allows comparison of self and population data at a glance and it helps in identifying patterns. So let me uh, walk you through to this visualization. So if you look at uh, vertically here, each of these column represent one participant's data. 
And if you look at these blocks, 0 to 24 to 48 and 72, these represent the post quit day, then day one, after post quit day one, after post quit day two, day three, and so on. Cigarette icons represent uh, their actual smoking episode and uh, color represents stress value. So red is high stress, green is low stress. So this one allowed us, so if you compare just horizontally, if I look horizontally in this block, I can see that what happened to all the participants in their pre-quit day. So if you see pre-quit day, very few people, like about half of the people smoked, but they could smoke. There was no restriction on them smoking on a pre-quit day. Even in the pre-quit day, there were one, two, three, and four participants who did not lapse. Then if we look at post-quit days, some participant lapsed, others did not lapse. We can see when they lapsed and how many cigarettes they smoked when they lapsed. We can also see their relationship with uh, smoking laps or not. So if you look at this particular middle column here, you will see that this participant is experiencing elevated stress for all these days, but this particular participant didn't lapse. So there may not be just a clear relationship with just stress and smoking. There are other factors that we need to consider. Then the next visualization shows smoke, it's a smoking event analyzer. And what it does, each of these uh, dots are smoking events, but this is more focused on all the smoking events that happened during this period. And if you see there is, this is a timed visualization, a temporal visualization. So you can see there is a lot of mess here, well, in the left-hand side, you will not see smoking events. There are hardly any smoking event in the left-hand side, but in the middle, there are a lot of smoking events. Towards the right, there are lots of smoking events. So it shows clearly a temporal relationship with smoking and time and stress in this visualization. <clears throat> so finally, there is a personal smoking history analyzer. And we have, as Polo said, sometimes people want to see data in a summary, summarized way. Sometimes they want to see the details. So in uh, Mike with Pelweb, participants can do that. They can see what they are doing, how they are doing, and they can examine data in a really great level of detail. ...is a flow visualization, and what it does, it tries to uncover if there is any impact of one common factor. So this is also focused on event of interest, and if you see that this is pre-quit, post-quit day one, post-quit day two, there are data from all the participants. From this representation, it's hard to know any, like hard to extract any meaning, but this is an interactive visualization. So you can filter, you can zoom in, zoom out, you can see all the participants, or you can just select one participant to see how this uh, visualization works. But the goal for this one was if there is a certain impact of interval. So if we see that after people quit smoking, the first four hours are really hard, and then everyone will face a lot of stress in those first four hours, we will see a spike in those regions where everyone is going through high level of stress. So this examines the relationship of interval and stress after people quit smoking. So to summarize, like we wanted to create a participant-centric visualization. And what we wanted to achieve, our goal was to create intuitive visualization that will be easy to understand, easy to extract meaning of. 
We applied abstraction when needed. We represented the same data in many different ways. So it would be easier to understand what's going on with one's uh, smoking history. Then we had this issue of really large data volume. We wanted to combine them in a way that users will not be overwhelmed. We try to use several interfaces and focus on different aspects of smoking in each of those interfaces. Then there are variety of data, there are objective sensor data and subjective data, and we want, we are investigating ways to combine them in meaningful ways. We also focused a lot on retaining user engagement and that's why we try to focus on things that they need. We looked at theories that talks about how we can help them to be more prepared in their effort in quit smoking. And we also created visualization that looks interesting and interactive so that they will not get uh, bored with the app or the system in a few days. So there are two uh, links here for the demos. So the videos for both the system, the web app and the mobile app are available. So you, you can uh, take a look at those. It explains uh, in detail what each of the interface does, actions it supports, and uh, what we are trying to do and still working on. So yeah, that's it. I'll take your questions now. Thank you, Moshmi. Uh, very nice work. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, now we uh, we can open the floor for questions, both for Polo as well as for Moshmi. Any questions from the audience? This is David Conroy. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, very well, David, please. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for the very interesting presentation, Paolo and Mushume. Uh, it looked like most of the data that you were visualizing with the tools you've developed came from the sensors. I could be wrong about that, though, so please let me know if I am. If uh, that is correct, though, have you incorporated any way of getting self-report data from EMAs in there to help with hypothesis generation? Because it looks like there could be a great... Uh, great value from combining those data streams. Uh, yeah, so maybe I can take, take, take it. Uh, the, this is Polo. Uh, yeah, so we are extending that uh, the event-based uh, visualization. So currently we are visualizing smoking labs. Um, so that's where the extension for it, where we hope to also add um, uh, like our kind of arbitrary it could be like a point kind of data, or it can be with the duration, and also with the annotations and point. Oh, um, that is where the EMA data could be integrated uh, into the visualization. Uh, so now I let me add something. So now David, what we are trying to do, um, if you remember the personal smoking history analyzer, we had a heat map and a. Uh, scatter plot of all the all the stress values so in the heat map right now we have smoking events but we also added we also are experimenting how we can add events like participants were in a social situation or participants were in a location uh, which is a bar or a restaurant so we are investigating some ways of adding those information in the personal smoking history profile. So we think we will add those as markers and let users uh, filter those out if they don't uh, want to look at them, because we feel that it's really valuable to have those information available. But at the same time, we also don't want to uh, clutter the interface too much. So it will be an option that we will provide them. So groups of information such as when they are in specific locations or if they are in a social situation, things like that, we are right now investigating how we can incorporate them intuitively in the existing interface. That's great, thank you. 
Okay, other questions? We are uh, close to the to to uh, the end of our. Maybe we can take one more question. So, Moshmi, have you thought about uh, adapting this visualization onto a smartwatch platform? So, smartwatch, what we are actually in the thinking right now is some of the visualization that runs in the my Quitpal mobile app, uh, we will we are thinking about whether we should take them away. So that's why we are doing a study to know if users are still comfortable just having this visualization on their mobile or web is a better platform. But for the integrating the smartwatch, we are certainly thinking about it, but not uh, analytic visualization. So the way we see it, smartwatches are great for providing micro messages or micro images. So we are thinking about utilizing that platform as a way to give them like more motivation, but not as a visualization part platform. I see. Okay. To uh, communicate with the user. Wonderful. That makes sense. Thank you. So we are at the end of the hour. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, from Moshmi, and thank you, Polo, both of you and your respective teams for this wonderful work. Uh, look forward to seeing, hearing more. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks, you everybody. for this opportunity. And please share your feedback with um, us, like me. I would be really interested if Absolutely. you have any feedback because we are actually planning to open up the web analytics part for researchers. So if you have data that you want to visualize in the visualization that we are supporting right now, you are welcome to do so. Maybe in, a, in the next two or three months, we will be able to open it up for researchers. Wonderful.